dog is back fighting for his life. Rushed to the hospital for tests. Minutes after being released, more bad news. We can now scan your lungs. We've identified a couple things that would kill you. Plus, Robert Blake's daughter speaks out about the night her mother was killed by her father. I've had such dark and scary times. Coming up next. Season 11 starts now. Today is a day of reckoning for my friend, Dog the Bounty Hunter. He's in the middle of the hardest year of his life, and we've been with him every step of the way. First, he lost his wife, Beth, to cancer, and now he's facing his own life or death health crisis. But he doesn't have to face it alone. Dog is backstage right now. He's here today so we can give him an overdue health intervention before it's too late. Before he comes out, let's take a look at how he got to today. Bring me the dog. Get him, boy. Dog the Bounty Hunter is known for his strength, courage, and compassion confronting criminals. Let's tell the truth right I now am. or you're going to jail. But when he came on our show this fall, he was struggling to confront his own grief over the death of his wife, Beth. I keep having dreams her in heaven, and I snuck up behind her. I used to do that a lot. <laughs> and she turned around and said, Big Daddy, what took you so long? I felt an immediate kinship with Dog. And when just a few weeks later, he was reported to have suffered a heart emergency, I rushed to Colorado to offer my support. Hi, sir, how are you? Good. I was worried about you. Going through his medical records and examining the bounty hunter, I was alarmed. 148 over 97. Is that good? No, you know that's not good. No, I don't know. I saw in the records Dog had checked out of the hospital against medical advice. I confronted him. Why'd you leave? The truth, I, I got scared. Then he confessed he had not fulfilled a promise he made to his wife, Beth, that he would quit smoking. Of course, I lied, said yes. Why'd you lie to her? Well, I thought I could, and I lasted about two hours before I needed a cigarette. It all added up to a very dangerous situation for Dog and I wasn't about to mince words. I'm looking at you and telling you as a friend, you're a ticking time bomb. You aren't gonna be here with the heart the way it is right now. After examining Dog, I was even more concerned with his condition. Like a lot of you watching at home, Dog was afraid to go back to the doctor. But I knew, like I said, that he was a ticking time bomb, and I urged him to get back to the hospital right away so he so could get the life-saving tests that he needed. Dog went into his cardiac catheterization, fearing the worst. This was a critical test of his heart health. Contrast dye would be injected, and x-rays would allow us to see if there were any potentially deadly blockages which would need medical intervention. During the procedure, Dog was in a twilight state, but still aware of what's going on. Great. Your right coronary looks wonderful. After a few minutes of scanning, the doctor leaned over to the bounty hunter with a surprising assessment. Guess what? Your heart looks good. I have a hard time saying that when he smokes so much. Yeah. Great news. But before Dog even got out of the cath lab, the doctor confronted him. So number one, you need to quit smoking for sure. Like, no more. I will not promise you that I'll quit, but I'll promise you that I'll cut down so far I will be able to quit. I'll take it. In recovery, Dog reached out to share the good news. Hey, what's the news? So, uh, there were no blocked arteries, no bad stuff. This is such fantastic news. We can now move to step two, which is to scan your lungs. All right, so I probably won't do it today. The bounty hunter was ready to bolt, but I wasn't having any of it. If I wait three days on something that's dangerous, if you can get the answer today, you're already there. So the most likely cause you're gonna die is the heart attack, that's off the list now. Second most likely cause is a pulmonary embolism or blood clot to your lungs. Take that off the list and we're good to go. All right, all right, love you, thank you, sir. Love you too, congratulations, I'm really, really happy. Dog agreed and headed off to the scan. 
Even before the results of the second test were in, Dog breathed a sigh of relief. I thought I was going home in a bucket. Dog was released and drove off, but minutes later, his doctor called with bad news. The CT scan results were in, and she needed to get a hold of Dog right away. Dog is waiting backstage right now, and I have the results of that chest CT scan right here. Coming up, Dog will join me right here on stage. We're going to face his health crisis head on. What do you think happened to Natalie Wood that night on your boat? I could hear you arguing. Natalie, I told you. Because her stateroom was right below the bridge deck. I went down below, and Robert opened the door. Now there's a back door to their stateroom. Robert Wagner was standing with his back against the back of the boat. So I walked through the stateroom. He looked at me and he says, Natalie's missing. He says, go search the boat. That's coming up tomorrow. I wait three days on something that's dangerous. At my insistence, Dog the Bounty Hunter agreed to a CT scan of his lungs that I deemed critical. He headed home after the procedure, but minutes later, his doctor called with bad news. The CT scan results were in, and she needed to get a hold of Dog right away. I have the results of Dog's chest scan. Let's get him out here right now so we can face this together. Please welcome my friend, Dog the Bounty Hunter. Well, first of all, thanks for coming. Yes, sir, thanks it for having me. Takes a lot to face what's going on in your life. So I thought we'd start off today sharing with you what I know, and then we're gonna get some more testing, if it's okay with you, right here on the stage. Sure. All right, so come on back. So this is what your scan looked like. And if you look at the lungs, you see something that really alarmed me, and I was fearful of this. You see how this normal artery here has a little white uh -huh. middle part? But this one has a little piece missing out of it. You notice it's white on the outside with the middle, it's like an eclipse, right. little black. That's a piece of blood clot that is actually inside the arteries of your lungs. That's called a pulmonary embolism. And the problem with these clots is when they block off the arteries, they don't let any oxygen get to the lungs. Right. And there are plenty of folks who die from these emboli. So when you learned about this, right. what went through your mind? Uh, the first thing I said was, how do we get rid of this? Yeah. So that's still what I'm asking you. Right, come on down. Uh, let me stand over here. I brought you some gloves. I thought you'd like purple. OK, thank you. So. I thought the best way to show someone like you who's used to seeing the evidence, I mean, the real truth up close, right. that you'd do best if I actually showed you what lungs look like. Okay. So healthy lungs are spectacular. They're sort of a beige color. Uh, they are uniform in their appearance. They're big. They exchange all the air back and forth. Right. And they're remarkable organs. Pulmonary embolism does this to your lungs. Oh, wow. You notice right in here, there's actually a clot. Can you all see that? Oh yeah, I see that, yeah. The clot right there? Yeah. That blood clot flew into this person's lung and probably killed them. Hmm. So you asked me how to treat it. Yes. So you took the blood thinners? Yes. Has your shortness of breath been okay? Yes. So that's one pin down. That's okay. one, good, one check mark, okay? But. There are other things that are still concerning me. This is what a lung looks like if you have emphysema. Yeah, wow. Now, I want you to actually pick this lung up because you see the little dark areas there? Right. You know what they're from? No. They're from the, the, the tar in your, in your cigarettes. This is a cigarette yeah. smoker's lung. Wow. See, this person didn't smoke. Right. This person did. So that the dark is from the tar, and this area that looks moth-eaten up here, you see right, it's like right. a big hole there? That's emphysema. Now, you have some personal experience with emphysema in your family. Yes. My mother and my sister. Wow. So you're genetically at risk yes. of this happening. So let's talk about this cigarette issue a little bit. <laughs> OK. How old were you when you started? 12 years old. 
It seemed pretty normal back then. Yes. How many packs per day for most of that time? Three and a half, probably. So I get concerned with that kind of amount every day, plus multiply it by 44 years in a young stud, because those, those equations don't match up. Right. Eventually, something's going to catch you. The cigarettes can lead to these pulmonary emboli because it makes your blood stickier. Right? When was the last time you had a cigarette? Uh, three hours ago. I'm, I'm, what you said, the patches, yeah. I have two on right here. So I've cut down a whole lot. I sleep better. Uh, my breathing's still the same, but I've, you know, I'm doing what you say. I've got to quit smoking. Well, I, I bring up the cigarettes for two reasons. Uh, I bring it up because obviously you don't want to have the emphysema, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but I also worry about the fact that it might be causing the blood clots in your lungs. That is one of the tests that we had done. Uh, it was looking at your hemoglobin the amount of red cells you have. If you have too many red cells, there's no room for them to move around. They stick and they can form a clot. So your red cell count, which normal red cell count hemoglobin is like 13 to 17. Yours was 20, which is so high that it actually has a, a name. <laughs> it's called polycythemia. Big name, but basically it means your body's overprodu overproducing red blood cells. Too many of those red cells, and my, some of it might be because of the smoking. Let me give you one other question. Okay. I can. The other reason that I, in my mind, I thought you might be making these clots that, don't, that could have killed you is the testosterone. Correct. Now, you're on a pretty hefty dose. What got you going with those? Uh, well, I'm a man, and the age, and uh, I work out, I fight, and the other. So I thought you could do better on all three if you've got some of that. I think testosterone, the right amount helps. You're taking a lot. But your body's not designed to have that high an amount. Right. So you understand the concerns with testosterone, raising your blood cell count. Yes. Causing the blood clots. You still decide to go back on some. Some. Small amount. Small amount. Right. We're going to measure that. Okay. okay. One last issue. The oxygen in your lungs when you go to bed at night is too low. That's one of the reasons we went through that test, looking at how well you slept in the evenings. And I did that, by the way. I know you did. Oh, you know. Because I have the results. Okay. <laughs> and the results were that your oxygen levels are pretty low when you sleep. Low enough that it could wake you up. Low enough that it's dangerous. So your doctors have, have been talking to me about giving you oxygen at night when you sleep. Right. That would mean taking the little nasal cannulas, you know, over your nose when you go to bed at night. Right. So if we stop the cigarettes, it might help with the oxygen. It might avoid the need to take the nasal cannulas at night. Right. Is that an exciting opportunity? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a must. Yeah. It's a must. So if you're in my office and you sort of are right now, right. I'd give you what's called the pulmonary function test. Are you okay with that? Yes. All right, so come on over here. Okay. We actually asked the people I think are best in the business come join us. This is Jessica. She's a certified respiratory therapist. Okay. She's from New Diagnostic Design. She brought a portable uh, pulmonary function test. Hi, how right. are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah. Okay. Have a seat if you don't mind. You can be as nice to her as you want, but she's gonna give you the data. This okay. is like the dragnet version. <laughs> right. Ready? Hi. Ready. Can you just confirm your date of birth? Is that correct? Yes. 53, okay. You keep going, we're gonna do a little commercial break. When we come back, we're gonna share your results. Okay. I'll be here with you, my friend. Thank you. All right, we're all going to take a, a little uh, break here, and when we come back, we're gonna learn the results of dog's pulmonary function test together. Then we're gonna reveal the steps that dog needs to take today to save his life. And I bet you, some of you are in the same boat. Stay with us. A parent's biggest fear. Babysitter horror stories. They just saw this two year old boy walking down the street. And the health crisis that hit the Osmonds twice. We have to fight. You have to keep fighting. That's coming up on Wednesday. Pull, deep breath in. Pull, 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 pull. Use your muscles. Good. Exhale nice and easy. Keep your mouth on through. Exhale through your mouth. The dog, the bounty hunter, has just taken a huge step in taking control of his health crisis. He's agreed to let us test his lung function with a pulmonary function test. You know, I've always believed that knowledge is power, but you're probably a little nervous now. Mm, yes. 
And what I really want to talk to you about today, and the reason you're such a role model for all of America, is because so many of us are afraid about our health. So I cannot tell you how honored, but also happy I am that you let us do this test. So I'm gonna ask Jessica just to give us the, 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 the information here. Black and white, as simple as it is. Is that okay? Yes. All right, Jessica. Okay. So the first test that we did was a force vital capacity. What we're looking at there is how much air can you maximally exhale after taking a deep breath in. Right. A normal volume is about 70%. Okay, your result, 86%. You, you know what that means, what she just told you? Kind of, but it's <laughs> like good news, but. I mean like incredibly good news, like shockingly good news. I'm a very good faker. <laughs> you, you can't fake this. I gotta admit, I feel like the cardiologist, that wonderful woman who figured out your heart didn't have right. a blockage, she felt a little bit awkward admitting that your heart looked good. I feel a little awkward saying that despite that many years of cigarettes, your lungs are somehow holding on. But there's also the issue whether you've damaged the actual cells. Remember how that lung had emphysema in it and it had little darkness? The holes in it. Right? The holes in it. That was the second part of the test, Jessica. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. All right. That's a very good start. So the next test we did was the diffusion test. And what this is looking at is how well oxygen can get from your lungs into the blood. So a normal percentage is about 80%. You are at 95%. So we consider 80% or above normal. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So let's talk a little bit about the overall situation, okay? So far, in the different testing, we've identified a couple of things that would kill you, but they're all fixable. And yet I look at you and I think to myself, the biggest blockage, the biggest thing that holds us back is the deeper anxiety that you have about all the things happening in your life. So let me start with a question that I think many will have. Your mom, sister had emphysema. Correct. People you loved dearly had lung disease. What was it like watching them suffer from that? Terrible. It was terrible because my mother wore oxygen, you know, for years, and there were wrinkles in her face from the oxygen uh, tube. So it wasn't good to look at. And she, when she came to Hawaii, uh, ninety-four, the doctor told her you don't need it at all because the air was so clean there, sea level versus one mile above in Colorado. And after a couple weeks, she took that off, she passed away in her sleep. So when you think about your life and the possibility that you would be on oxygen, like your mom was. Oh, not good. Well, when you know there's hope, you need to take the chance. If you don't know there's any hope, you usually, at least I don't even want to mess with it. So with the test like that, I want to stop smoking. I want to stop. I want to for the first time ever. So now let me broach the bigger issue. When I see a man who's able to do the things he wants to do in life, right, raise solid kids, be in love with a woman with all your heart, be successful in your day job, Right? Catching right. folks, being a TV star. You I mean the things you want to do, dog, you do well. Thank you. I I'm worried about your cigarettes, but I'm more worried about why you're smoking. So I want to get to the root cause of that. And I want to touch on this a little bit because it's critical, not just for you, dog, but people, there are millions of people who admire you, respect you, and they're going to follow what you do. Thank you. If you can deal it, they can do it. And you're going to show them how to do it. You know, I'm glad you say that because I'll, I'll show them. I'm going to stop. That's what the point of you being here today is. I'll tell you, I know you have a chemical addiction, but the emotional addiction is a bigger problem because you started when you were so young. See, at age 12, you began to think, I can't do those things. I can't be dog if I don't have a cigarette going like this. Right. And then you actually believe that BS. And here you are, a grown man, world famous, and you still believe it. Whereas everyone watching, I hope, is realizing that you're still dog with or without a cigarette in your hand. Right. But if you don't believe that deep in your heart, dog, then of course you're not gonna give it up. Right, well, like, you said, like I said, this is my warning. And I'm gonna take that, you'll see that. Right. I'm an Aquarius, I got it. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna take that warning. So, in order to, to get the ball rolling, 
I introduced you to my best friend, Dr. Michael Royzen. He's at the yes. Cleveland Clinic. He is the best person I know of in the world getting people off cigarettes. And he does it because he stalks people. Now, you've been talking to him. Yes, sir. You're supposed to talk to him every day. Well, through text, we have been. You have been. Yeah. How's that going? Well, he is a stalker. You just told me that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Does he need a job? <laughs> no, he's got a full-time job, but he cares about you like I do. Well, okay. thank you. All right, one other issue I want to bring up. Yes, sir. You got a wonderful woman who's helping take care of you. Her name is Katrina. She's a nurse practitioner, and she's yes. on Zoom right now. All right, hey, oh. Katrina, how are you? Hi, Doc. Hi, Dr. Oz. I'm fine. So it's not just the cigarettes that I'm worried about. It's the broader issues that dog's struggling with. So, Katrina, what do you have to say to dog today? Um, well, thanks for getting that pulmonary function testing done. And, um, yeah, bring a copy of that for me back to Colorado, will ya? I will. I know he was <laughs> resistant. Good dog, you were resistant to getting that test. Right. Yes, you were saying Yeah, you're... I'm really happy that it's normal. So congratulations on that. Thank so you. So as you cut down on the cigarettes, you know, the withdrawal symptoms are really kind of painful, including having some anxiety and some depression. Um, you know, I really recommend that you see a therapist. Therapists are trained for years and years and years to help with anxiety. Um, lucky for you, we've got a great therapist who's trained in both addiction and in anxiety. And I think seeing her for a few sessions would really, you know, improve your chances for success and, and, and help you in the long run with the anxiety. So, Dog, I've been speaking to Katrina quite a bit, and we both thought that therapy might work. Right. But you, when she's offered to you the opportunity for some therapy, you've said that you're your own therapist. Well, I told her I am, I am a therapist, and I really am. But now you <laughs> tricked me, Katrina. You got me. So, yes, I will see the therapist and give that a try. So, two questions for you, dog. Yes, sir. You're a cut and dry person. Question number one. I'm gonna make it clean for everyone to understand it because I want people at home watching you to make the same commitment for their own loved ones or for themselves. Question number one, will you commit today to seeing a therapist as soon as you go home? Just yes or no? Yes. Question two, will you commit to continually <laughs> dealing with Dr. Royzen until you kick this habit of 44 years and are no longer addicted to cigarettes? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. All right. So, I'm gonna be clean and simple on this. You hunt bad guys, but I hunt people like you. Right. Dr. Royzen is particularly a good ally in that mode. We will come after you. We care about you too much. Thank you. To let you trip. I am so happy that you've been blessed with a second chance. I knew this. Yes. And I know you lost Beth and you're sad about it. And I know you're gonna be unhappy sitting at night, staring at the ceiling, thinking you're by yourself, not realizing that there are people who love you dearly and are there for you. This is your family. Yeah. And there's some pretty cool people there. Thank you. And those folks desperately want you around. I think you ought to put pictures of them everywhere. I think you gotta call them and crutch on them and your friends. That's always been the salvation for darkness. I mean, God speaks to us through the people he puts around us. Right. He gives you what you're prepared to deal with. And they're there to help you, and they'll feel good about it. But you gotta be vocal about the fact that you're feeling down, and you're a man, and that's okay. There are lots of men who feel down, and you're gonna tackle it with every tactic, including the therapist that Katrina's gonna get for you. Because it's not a sign of weakness. But if you hide that, that darkness, that anxiety, you're gonna fall prey to something else besides cigarettes. Okay. Like, that's okay, go away, or that's okay, I'm gonna no, do it? No, that's okay, I'm gonna do it. I mean, I'm, okay. gonna do, I'm gonna quit smoking cigarettes, and I'll use any technique, again, that's, that's not a felony to do that. I'll be here for you. Can you give me a hug? Thank you. Dog about it. The season finale of Dogs Most Wanted airs on WGN America this Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Do not miss it. The man is gold. We'll be right back. Thank you. Robert Blake was infamously the prime suspect in his wife Bonnie Lee Bakley's murder. But what happened to their baby daughter, Rose? Coming up, she's opening up about how she survived her traumatic childhood.
Today we're teaming up with People Magazine to bring you a daytime exclusive. When Rose Lenore was just 11 months old, her mother, Bonnie Lee Bakley, was shot and her father, Robert Blake, was charged with Bonnie's murder. Rose is now 19 years old and is here to open up about her traumatic childhood. But, but first, take a look at the case that shattered her life before she was even a year old. Robert Blake began performing at the young age of six in Our Gang, later known as The Little Rascals. He would go on to appear in dozens of movies and TV shows throughout the next six decades. He would become a household name while starring in the 70s cop show, Beretta. In 1999, Robert Blake met Bonnie Lee Bakley in an LA nightclub. They had a daughter named Rose in 2000 and quickly wed. He would become her 10th husband. After dinner at an LA restaurant, Bonnie was killed by a single bullet hole to the head while sitting in the front seat of Blake's car. Blake claimed to be inside the restaurant. A year later, Blake was arrested and charged with Bonnie's murder. He would spend a year in jail awaiting trial. After a high profile trial, Blake was found not guilty but the lives of Blake and his daughter Rose were forever changed. Joining me now is Dr. Al Show investigative reporter Mars Campo. Bonnie Lee Bakley was killed just moments after she and her new husband, Robert Blake, finished here at an L.A. restaurant. What was Robert Blake's alibi? Dr. Oz, this is one of the stranger alibis we've heard. Blake says that he left his wife sitting in the car, parked, because he had to go back to the restaurant where they just finished dinner to get something he'd forgotten. And the thing he said he left behind was his gun. So he says he went back to the restaurant to get his gun, and when he got back to the car, she was shot to death. But perhaps surprisingly, investigators say the gun he forgot in the restaurant was not the murder weapon. Oh, it's a strange thing to happen. Strange thing to happen and strange alibi. Bonnie Lee Bakley, educate us about her. Yeah, uh, you know, by all accounts, she had a very colorful history. As you mentioned in the piece, Blake was her 10th husband. She oh. had been married nine times prior. At the time that they met, she was on parole for a fraud conviction. Hmm. And she had a reputation as being a bit of a con artist, someone who preyed on lonely older men. And she also had a reputation for being celebrity obsessed. In fact, at the time that her daughter with Blake was born, she was also seeing Marlon Brando's son, Christian Brando, and she in fact named him as the father of the baby. When a paternity test revealed that it was in fact Blake's child, Blake and Bakley got married shortly thereafter. So in 2005, a civil court jury found Robert Blake was liable for his wife's death. They awarded her children $30 million. An appeals court upheld that decision, but they reduced the damages to $15 million. What was the difference between the criminal trial where he was acquitted and the civil trial where he you know, the wrongful death lawsuit. Yeah, this is not something that is terribly uncommon. We saw it very famously with the O.J. Simpson case. You know, the bar for a criminal conviction is much higher. You have to convince all 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt. And in Blake's case, prosecutors had no fingerprint on the murder weapon. They had no eyewitnesses. They had no DNA. In yeah. fact, jurors called their case flimsy. That's the word that they used. In the civil case, you only have to convince nine of the 12 jurors, and the standard is a preponderance of the evidence. Right. So lawyers for Bakley's grown children were able to show that Blake was responsible for her death. Everyone should know Robert Blake denies any involvement in Bonnie's murder. So what happened to Robert after all these legal problems? Yeah, you know, all of these legal troubles created a lot of financial troubles. So in addition to mounting legal bills, he had the $15 million judgment from the civil case. Yeah. So he did file for bankruptcy in 2006. On a personal level, he got married again to, for the third time in 2017, but that didn't last long. They got divorced about after a year. So now he's 86 years old. He's living largely in seclusion, out of the spotlight, and he recently told an interviewer that he considers himself half dead. Oh my goodness, half dead. Half dead, just getting by. So Robert Blake did not see his now 19-year-old daughter, Rose Lenore, from the time she was five until just recently. Rose broke her silence about her mom's murder in a People exclusive. Coming up, Rose Lenore is here, revealing how she survived her traumatic childhood and what it was like to hug her father, Robert Blake, again after 13 years apart. The texting suicide case. The victim's family speaks out about Michelle Carter's early release from jail. That's coming up Thursday on Dr. Oz.
When Rose Lenore was just 11 months old, her mother was killed and her father, Robert Blake, was charged with murder. 18 years later, Rose is breaking her silence for the first time in a People Magazine exclusive. She joins us now for her very first daytime interview. Now, Rose was raised by her half-sister, Delina, Delina Blake, actually, is the last name, and her brother-in-law, Greg. After they adopted her, she began calling them mom and dad. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. How old were you when you realized what had happened to your birth parents? Um, there was never really an age where I realized. I always remember knowing, so my parents never kept it from me. What was it like growing up without your birth mother? Um, it was hard. I had a pretty normal childhood, but I did always feel like a part of me was missing, and I always wanted to know if she was, you know, watching me or if she was proud of me. Do you think she is watching you? I hope so. I think hope so. so. In the People Magazine article, you confided that you've used therapy, you relied on, you crutched on it yeah. to help you get through these years. When did you start? I think I've, I've always been in therapy. I've gone to so many therapists. I think I've been going since I was maybe seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did you cope with the possibility, the accusations that your father may have been responsible for the loss of your mother? It was hard to handle, and it still is. Um, I think years of talking about it in therapy and talking to friends about it and things like that have just helped me kind of cope with it and deal with it. So what's your message to anyone watching who thinks there's a stigma about therapy? I mean, there is a stigma about therapy, and it sucks. That shouldn't be there. I mean especially young people going to therapy, they don't want to. I didn't want to. Um, but once you go and you're really open-minded and you forget about that, um, it's definitely worth it and it'll help you with so much. Could you help me understand some of the blowback that's happened since the People Magazine article? What are people upset about? Yeah, so that's been really hard. I've had a lot of good, you know, positive support from the people around me, which I love but there are so many negative comments saying that I would be using this story to be famous or to be an actress, and that is not what I'm doing. I've always wanted to come forward and tell my story, um, and I just happen to want to be an actress. Those are separate things for me. I would never use my biological mother's death to be famous, and that is horrible to me that people would assume that. Did your father ever think that? No, I don't think so. I hope not. As you went through high school and people began realizing who you were, yeah. did you ever have to deal with paparazzi? Yeah, um, I was a cheerleader in high school and they showed up to one of my football games and that was a little, it was scary. <laughs> I didn't really know what was going on. Someone was taking pictures of me, and then a few weeks later it was out in the magazine. So that was definitely difficult for me. How would your classmates deal with that? And, and did you change your interactions with them at all? Um, yeah, it felt, it kind of felt like there was a gap between us. I think even as a, a little kid, I'd always been dealing with a lot of heavy, things that my classmates weren't dealing with. Yeah. And I think that was just a big reminder of that and how different my life is from theirs. So after the age of five, I understand you had not seen your dad. Yeah. What thoughts did you have about him? What had you remembered about him from that last visit? I remember bits of pieces and it was, they're all positive. Um, I remember we would play outside all the time. Um, we would, go for hikes, look for bugs, um, <laughs> take walks together. It was all, it was all fun. All right, so up next, Rose is revealing what it would take for her to ask her father, Robert Blake, about her mom's murder. A parent's biggest fear, <laughs> babysitter horror stories. I just saw this two-year-old boy walking down the street. And the health crisis that hit the Osmonds twice. We have to fight. You have to keep fighting. That's coming up on Wednesday.
I'm back with Rose Lenore, the daughter of actor Robert Blake. When Rose was only 11 months old, her mother, Bonnie Lee Bakley, was murdered. A jury in a California criminal court found Robert not guilty in Bonnie's death, but he was later found liable for her murder in a wrongful death lawsuit. So, Rose, you recently saw your father, Robert Blake, for the first time in 13 years. But did it feel real? It was surreal. I didn't really know how to feel. For the first, like, 30 minutes of our meeting, it just, it felt like I was in another world. It was someone that I'd always seen on TV or in the pictures in my memories. And then he was sitting on the couch right next to me, and it was just shocking. You had a big hug at the end. Yeah. What was that like? Um, crazy. I mean, it was, it was definitely nerve-wracking. It was kind of awkward. Um, but it, it felt good. It was like we, had, we sat and talked for like three hours, and I felt like we just really got to know, you know, what we missed in each other's lives over the years. What kinds of questions did he ask? I'm just curious. After 13 yeah. years, he must have wanted to know so much. Oh, yeah. He asked, you know, how it was in school for me, how it was with my parents, mom and dad, Delina and Greg, how it was with my sister. I mean, it was, it was really exciting. Was there anything surprising about what you had missed in his life that's helped you? It was really nice hearing that we have similar interests. I've always been really creative. I never really made sense in school. I wasn't good at many things except for art and performing. Mm -hmm. And hearing that he was the same way as a kid was kind of validating. I understand on the topic of your biological mom, Bonnie Lee, yeah. you decided not to talk about it. Yeah. How did you make that decision and how did that help the discussion? Um, I, I wasn't ready to know the answer. Um, he kind of brought it up and I said, you know, I'm not ready. I don't want to hear that. I really want to get to know him for who he is now and I want him to know me for who I am now. I don't want to I don't want to have all that complicated stuff in it. And it's, it's scary and overwhelming. And I need a lot of time before I'm going to be ready to hear it. How did he bring it up? Um, well, he asked. He said, do you, you know, he brought her up. He said something about me being similar to her or things like that. And I just said, I don't want to, before you continue, I don't want to know about that night. I don't want to know what happened. Do you think there's a point in your life and it may take a while where you would want to know the answer to that? I think so. I hope that there is. Um, but I, I'm not going to push myself. I'm making so many big choices right now yeah. that I just need to take it one step at a time. Why did you decide to meet him? Did you one day wake up and said, I, I want to reconnect? I've always wanted to meet him. It wasn't a possibility as a kid. There was so much, you know, complications between the, the adults in the family. And I was a kid, I didn't really understand everything. And I wasn't really allowed to see him. He wasn't a part of my life after age five. So I knew that as soon as I turned 18, I'd be going to meet him. Now that you're an adult, yeah. you're gonna have to make a lot of decisions. Yeah. If you were to find out that your dad was responsible for your mom's murder, how would that affect you? Would you want to know? Or would you rather never hear the truth? Right now, I don't want to know. Someday, I might. I have no idea yet. And I don't know how I'll react when I find out. I think that would be really difficult, but I, I hope it wouldn't end up that way. So what advice would you give to everyone out there watching who's coping with traumatic childhoods? Even if it's not quite like yours. <laughs> I mean, Growing up is really hard, and it's still hard. I've had such dark and scary times, um, but I hope that I can be proof to people that it, it does get better, and you have to just hold on to that little bit of hope that you have, and it'll get you through it. Has acting helped you get through it? Yeah. I think all the creative things that I've done have helped me process you know, what I've been through. Did your father give you any advice on acting? I'm just curious. I, I, yeah. I learned about him through Beretta. 
Right. Other viewers have learned that you know, through Little Rascals, but we all know he's a great actor. Yeah. Um, I told him not to. I don't want him or anyone to think that I'm using him to further my acting career. I've always wanted to meet him, and so I met him, and I'm, I'm keeping that completely separate from you know, me figuring out what I want to do. You're a very mature young woman. Good luck to all the things you have Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. I want to thank People Magazine for bringing us this exclusive. You can read even more about Rose's impressive story at people.com. We'll be right back. Natalie Wood's death, an Oz exclusive. Her boat captain reveals never before heard details. Robert Wagner was in that jealous rage. All new Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. On the next true crime, the death of Hollywood superstar Natalie Wood, one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of all time. With new eyewitness accounts emerging, speculation surrounding her death continues to grow. I'm sitting down exclusively with Natalie Wood's friend and boat captain, Dennis Deverne. As the world continues to ask, did Natalie's husband, Robert Wagner, play a part in her death. Take a look. With doe-eyed innocence that evolved into smoldering sensuality, actress Natalie Wood made the leap from child star to ingenue and leading lady to international icon with ease. Married, divorced, and remarried to actor Robert Wagner. The telegenic couple became one of Hollywood's most tumultuous duos, ending with Natalie's untimely and tragic death in 1981. Her last night alive was spent with Wagner on their yacht, with their guest, actor Christopher Walken. Six hours later, her body, floating face down, was recovered a mile away. The Los Angeles County Coroner's autopsy in 1981 would deem her death an accidental drowning, but note that her body was covered with bruises. The yacht's captain, Dennis Deverne, reported hearing an explosive and alcohol-fueled fight between Wagner and Wood before her death. And just last year, Robert Wagner was named a person of interest by investigators after two additional witnesses emerged that supported Deverne's account. Coming up on the next True Crime, what really happened on the boat that night? And what Dennis Deverne claims took place after Natalie's death that is even more shocking. I'll see you next time.